Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for another Monday This and That vlog where I talk about all kinds of different things, leading you back to some old videos if I have them out, letting you know of projects I have going on, and answering questions that may have come in in the past week and whatever I feel like talking about. So let's get to the topics of today. And the first thing I wanna start off with are the jar covers. I recently got asked about these and actually the ones I've been using up until this past week were all ones that somebody had made for me a few years ago, one of my followers. And I love them. I use them quite a bit, though a lot of them were made with pink. And I am just really, I'll, I might wear pink now and then. But as far as decor goes, I'm not a pink person. <laughs> And so I thought it's about time I finally get some jar covers made up that are more my style. And so I changed the style just a little bit. And you can see I've got a bunch here. I've got some back there on my apple scrap vinegars because these are apples that have been processing that I peeled and cored. And I just throw those in a jar with sugar and water and then let them turn to vinegar. And the main purpose I use them for is for vinegar making. Anything where I'm not going to have a lid on it because... The jar covers, not only do they look nicer than using a coffee filter and a band or using just a random piece of fabric or coffee filter and a rubber band, they are easier to use because you can simply slip them off, do your stirring, slip them back on. No need to fiddle with a band or a rubber band and they just look cute. So I wanted to explain how I made mine. I made mine just a little bigger than the ones that were made for me so I could have a little bit bigger ruffle on them because I think it's cuter and also easier to grab hold of when you go to slip it off the jar. And these don't need to be on these jars. They're just here because it looks cute and I have them sitting out. So I found a nine inch circle, nine inch diameter to be perfect. So you just want to cut out a nice neat nine inch circle. And maybe I will do a separate video on this, but for those who are already so, I just wanted to throw this out there real quick. And then I did a single fold hem all the way around and then after that, I measured in one inch and took my pencil and then drew a line all the way around one inch in from the hem. And I use my knuckle because that's approximately one inch. So you can do that, you know, just measure your knuckle to see if that's close. Because um, I, I, even though I have very little hands, my fingers are long for the size of my hand. So they're closer to the size of a average person's finger, but you're going to want to check, double check that if you have short fingers or very long fingers. But anyway, for me, the knuckle thing works. So from here to here is an inch. And then um, once I've got that circle on the inside, by the way, on the inside of the fabric here, once I've got that drawn, you can also use chalk. I recommend either a pencil, a white pencil or chalk, depending on the how dark your fabric is. Then I take elastic like this. So a lot of you who've been following me for a while know that I'll use either brand new sheets as fabric. I'll just buy the colors and styles I need because a lot of times it's cheaper to do that. You can get 100% cotton sheets and then use that those as fabric. It typically ends up being cheaper per yard or even old sheets that you picked up at garage sales or you don't use anymore and you can recycle those and do all kinds of things with them and so and I have a video just on that by the way I'll link to down below but anyway I save the elastic out of the fitted sheets if it's a good elastic and it's in good shape and it's not the kind that's been stitched down all the way but rather the kind where they made a casing and then inserted the elastic because then I can just pull it right out sometimes if it's stitched down I mean it could be tedious trying to take all those stitches out to get this elastic off sometimes it's not sometimes you can just rip it off but um if it ends up damaging the elastic then it's really not worth it but anyway, yes, this ends up being the perfect kind of elastic. It's very, very stretchy. It was basically free. And then I simply lay it on the line that I've drawn and then just start doing a zigzag stitch right over the top, stretching it all the way as I go. It can be a little tricky getting the hang of the feel of that, but that's how I do it. I don't make a casing. I just keep it simple and stitch it directly onto the fabric. 
and I found that stretching it all the way, you gotta pull it out all the way to make it just the right tightness, that it's gonna have a nice snug fit around here. I had one where I didn't stretch it as much, and then I had to redo it because it was just too loose. Because the thing about making vinegar, you got to expect you're going to have fruit flies. I don't know, maybe there's a few places around the world that somebody's not going to get fruit flies, but they're very much attracted to vinegar. And so that having a band or something to hold that snugly in place, the purpose of that whole thing is to keep the bugs out, as well as dust, lint, and whatever else that's in the air. You want that elastic tight enough that they can't just crawl under there. Now, if you're wanting to make these for a regular mouth jar, you can make that circle a little bit smaller if you want, or just leave it the same size and simply go in an inch and a half, which is actually what I did with this one. It was the first one I made. I was just kind of guessing where to place it, so I thought I'd try an inch and a half, which made it just, I could fit it over a wide mouth, but it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't quite roomy enough but I found it was the perfect size for a regular mouth. It gives you a bigger ruffle when you do it that way, but it's still very cute. So just an inch and a half in after you hem it around the edges, it's a real, as narrow as you can get it. And then um, that makes it perfect for that. Now, though these are intended mostly for vinegar making, when I've got stuff sitting out on the counter, let's say I've got some jars sitting out because I'm in the process of dehydrating something and I don't have the jars all filled up yet, I'm really liking the idea of doing this, of putting the jars and having them with the covers on them just to make them look cute while I'm waiting to get them topped off and then vacuum sealed and put back in storage. But I also put these on here so just so I could demonstrate, just so you could see all the great colors. I got a chicken print back here. I've got a woodsy print, kind of a cabin-y feel. A dark green. I've got this farm print here. I, I love this one. Um, you can see my different browns, sunflower, a red plaid, and a nice sage green with a tone on tone leaf print. I'm really loving these things and I'll probably end up making a bunch more because they are kind of fun. I can whip them up. It only takes me a few minutes really to whip one up. So anyway, now let's talk about what's in these jars. So first let me mention the chili. I was going to talk about the potatoes next, but uh, last week if you saw my video on dehydrating the pinto beans, how I cooked them, then dehydrated them, and then I found that's great. I'm loving this. I'm going to start doing this from now on. And I decided before I made it my next big pot of chili, I would go ahead and take out a jar of chili that I already had canned up and it was just a pint sized jar and try it with that first. So I put it on my dehydrator tray and, and it was just enough to fill up a, a single dehydrator tray, dried it up, then took about half of it and cooked it up for lunch. And it turned out great. I was actually really surprised. So it really didn't take a whole lot longer to just add water to it and then cook it. Maybe five minutes tops is all you need. You know, you'll just have to try it. You know, it's going to depend obviously on how high the heat is, but it didn't take that much longer than taking it straight from a jar and then heating it through. And it was, it was delicious. I didn't notice any difference in texture from eating it right after it's cooked or straight from a jar that had been pressure canned than just cooking it up from a dehydrated state. So I'm going to start doing that from now on because it's going to save at least a little bit of space. It doesn't save a ton of space like some dehydrated things do, but it, it will save some. And that way I don't necessarily have to cook a massive pot at a time just to try to fill up my canner. I can just cook up some extra, have it for dinner one or two nights, and then dehydrate up the rest and then vacuum seal it for whenever we need it so and also this kind of thing this would be really great for taking camping or anything when you need something lighter obviously in that case you'd want to seal it up in mylar bags or something like that but anyway you'd still have to cook it you still got to add some water and cook it um because the heat's going to help it rehydrate faster and you want it hot anyway so yeah it's pretty good and i had black olives in there and they turned out great so there's that. Now let's talk about the potatoes. So this year I was going to go ahead and can more potatoes. The only thing I liked canned potatoes for is making potato salad. It does make it easy and fast to have those on hand. But when I look back there, I only make potato salad typically during the summer. And I still 
have quite a few jars. Even with all the potato salad I made this year, even though I was making using two quart jars at a time to make the potato salad, I still have a ton. So as I'm digging my potatoes up, I've decided I am gonna go ahead and dehydrate up a bunch. Now last year I did some dehydrated mashed potatoes and I did do a video on that that I'll link to down below. That's in the description box by, by the way, just below the screen. Look for the word more or show more. Click on that, it'll open it up to find all my links in there. But this year I decided to go ahead and try potato chunks like this. You can see just kind of diced up uh, like I would for making a fried potato or a potato salad and also slices here. So this would be something I would use in making the moussaka, which I do have a recipe on. So how I did this, I'll go ahead and lay it out real quick for you. Even though I'll be doing a separate video, it'll be a ways down the road. What I did in this case, instead of boiling the potatoes, I decided to bake them instead. I'll make a pan of the diced ones and a pan of the sliced ones and then bake them at 350 for about 40 minutes ish and just you just want to make sure when it comes to potatoes those are one of the things you do want cooked first before you dehydrate or if you do it because if you dehydrate them in a raw form they can turn black from oxidation now some people find just soaking them in salt water i think it is will prevent that as well or maybe even adding just a touch of lemon juice, but I decided to go ahead and bake them. I think it's gonna make it easier also for the rehydration process when you do that. And then, yeah, I found about 40 to 45 minutes at 350 seemed to be just right. Then I put them, spread them out on my trays. In this case, I do uh, use the cloth on there. I like using the cloth. It keeps any small pieces from falling through. And this is just cotton cloth. And you would have seen in Friday's video that just published where I was talking a little bit more about this. And it does help actually help it to dehydrate faster. So you want something that's breathable and natural. You don't want any synthetic fabrics when you're doing this. Um, the potatoes, especially the sliced ones, will kind of stick. You might have to peel them off, but it's not that hard. They come off pretty easily. And by the way, I did turn the heat up on these since I'm not using the silicone and there's no plastic in there. I turned the heat up to 125 so they would dehydrate faster. And it, it does go pretty fast. I think maybe six hours they're done. Obviously you're going to kind of squish them and check them and like with the slices, see if they're, if you can crack them, you can tell by feeling them that they're dry. You just try pinching them. If you can pinch them at all and there's any give to it, they probably need a little more time, especially with the trunk chunks. This is what I wasn't quite sure about with the potatoes, cutting them that, that big. Cause the dried ones I've got from Mother Earth products, they're cut a lot smaller than this, but I wanted bigger ones so I could try using them in various different things. I might even try cooking them up and see how well they would work for making a potato salad. I might not make a potato salad out of it. I'll just try cooking up a little bit and see what the consistency is like. Though in that case, I do think boiling them might work better for making a potato salad because obviously these, as you can see right here, they do get, they're gonna get a little bit browned if you bake them, but I figured that would also add a little bit of flavor. And the nice thing about the baking is that it starts to dry them out a little bit anyway. And so it makes them, as long as you don't cover the potatoes, it's gonna make them dehydrate even faster than if you boil them and then put them on your trays. So anyway, the point, the, the main point I wanted to make, this is really important, is that I found the potatoes out of anything will hold the heat far longer than pretty much anything else. And I had a couple of jars that I thought the potatoes were pretty cool, put them in the jar, and then I noticed the next day there was a little bit of condensation in there, which means there was still some heat holding in those potatoes despite how they felt to the touch. And that was causing um, moisture to build up inside the jar, so I had to dump them out into my trays and dry them for another hour or so all over again. Then what I found is once they are dry, I take them off the trays, I use my board right here, take them immediately off the trays and spread them out on the board as much as I can so the heat can come out of them faster. And then you might need to leave them for a while. They're not like making tomato flakes that will almost, as soon as they're cool, they seem to immediately start absorbing the moisture from the air. The potatoes won't do that, trust me. I left them for as long as an hour, I think it was, and they were fine. They didn't get any softer. 
that way and then I felt them and I knew for sure they were cool and then I put them in the jars and vacuum sealed them. So that's a really important step. But just like anything, when you're dehydrating, especially trying something new, after you put it in the jar and you vacuum seal it, leave it out for a minimum of a day because you wanna make sure that your jars stay sealed because sometimes they, if they're gonna lose a seal, it's typically gonna happen within the first 24 hours. And then you wanna check and see if there's any moisture in the jar. And so that's, that's really important. And so that's another reason why I left it out. And I was able to check that and find, okay, I didn't let it cool enough. So I learned my lesson right away from there, rather than putting it back into storage and not realizing there was still warmth in that jar, creating moisture and condensation buildup, which would then turn to mold. And those potatoes would have been nasty had I not caught that but these look great. These have been sitting since, uh, some of these anyway, some of these I just put in the jar this morning and some of these have been sitting since last night and I see no condensation in the jars and so they're just fine. Now, another dehydrated thing that I did up last year and I keep forgetting I have it is the rhubarb powder. I decided last year when I was dehydrating a bunch of rhubarb to dehydrate up, uh, to powder up some of it so I can start experimenting with it and using it in various things. I kept forgetting I had it. My purpose of doing this was because I thought it would be a great replacement for lemon juice since we can't grow lemons here. I thought the rhubarb powder would make a great lemon replacement when you want that more tart flavor. Just sprinkle a little bit of this in. Well, I finally remembered to give it a try when I made the apple pie I posted on the community section. I'm like, oh yes, the rhubarb powder. I keep meaning to try that and I thought it'd be perfect. So these were apples I just picked from my tree and we were having a lady soap making thing here. Um, it's some just some close friends of mine I invited over for a luncheon and also to teach them how to make soap and it was really fun. But anyway, I put in probably maybe one to two teaspoons. I don't know, I didn't measure it out. I just put some in, tasted it and then put in a little bit more and it turned out really, really good. So I'm super excited about being able to use my own rhubarb powder as a lemon juice replacement, because even you know, buying organic lemon juice can be rather expensive. I do keep some on hand all, at all times, but I'm always looking for ways to start utilizing more of the things I know I can grow to replace the things that I can't get easily enough or maybe won't ever be able to get because I can't grow them here and maybe I won't have access to be able to just purchase these things from Vitacost. Like that's where I get my organic lemon juice and Mother Earth products is where I get some of my freeze dried fruits that we can't grow such as pineapple, mangoes and bananas. So if I don't have access to that, then I want to know that I have something that would be a good enough replacement. Obviously with the fruits, those are just a luxury, you know, because we can grow berries like crazy around here. We get all kinds of berries and apples and more. But uh, when it comes to something like lemon juice, especially if you're using it and making pies and crisp and more to help bring out the flavor of the whatever it is you're making, then uh, yeah, the rhubarb powder should work great. Now what I'd like, I'm going to try to work on finding out is if it would also work in helping to prevent oxidation when you're preparing different things, such as when you're dehydrating apples, you're going to get oxidation, which is what you have here. See, the apples are gonna turn brown. I personally don't care because anything I'm gonna use the dried apples in, they're gonna turn dark anyway. Typically, I'm adding cinnamon or something. So mostly I dry these up like this to use for making dried apple pies through the year and which I actually typically like better. They tend to have more flavor, but if you didn't want, if you were gonna just eat your apples, you wanted them to have a more not so brown look, there's, you know, putting a little bit of juice on them of pretty much any kind would actually help prevent that. And maybe I could either do a rhubarb juice, uh, my own homemade rhubarb wine, or even just take the powder, mix it in a little water, and then just brush it onto my apples, if that really mattered, which, it doesn't to me. So I'm gonna try experimenting on the next batch of apples I do, just taking some of them and making a, taking the powder and mixing it with water and just brushing it onto the apples just to see if it helps prevent oxidation. And I'll get back to you on another this and that, maybe as soon as next week. So I, I'm planning on doing some more apples either today or tomorrow anyway. So we'll give that a try. Okay, now let's talk just a little bit about the collaboration. So the, this is the photo collaborations I'm doing with my followers. I did close out the canning one. I extended it one more week, but that's closed out now. So I'm not accepting any more photos for the canning collaboration, but 
We have two more coming up right away. That's going to be the garden. Well, maybe not right away, but you can start sending photos for this. And this is the garden collaboration will be the next one. So any photos you took throughout the season of your garden, uh, just make sure that for that particular topic, you send all your photos you're gonna submit, uh, preferably no more than five or six. I'm only gonna select three out of that. I don't mind having a few different ones to select from. I'm gonna select the ones that are gonna be the best looking ones and also the easiest ones to work with. Just make sure they're all in one email instead of a bunch of separate emails. And you'll put on that, on the subject line, you're gonna put garden collaboration. And make sure you let me know what name you want me to attribute to your, fo your photo, whether it be your first and last name, your first name only, your first name and last initial, or your channel name or your blog name, whatever it is that you'd like me to put in there, as long as it's not super, super long. So nice, clean photos, and you'll send those to raincountryhomestead at gmail.com. Then the next collaboration after that, and you can start sending these now, and these, again, would be set in its own email. If you're part of the craft collaboration, all the photos you wanna submit will go in that email under the title craft collaboration. And these can be any crafting project you've done. Now, last year when we did it, I had it all be items that were based off of my own videos, whether it be crochet videos or sewing videos, such as making aprons and skirts and so on. And, and that, that turned out really great. That was a lot of fun. And by the way, I'll link to the full uh, collaboration playlist that we've been working on for over a year now it's been really fun we have all kinds of different topics that we do but this year the difference is that it doesn't have to be anything based off of my videos unless you want it to be yes you can still submit you know if you did a patchwork skirt based off my videos or an apron based off my videos or any crocheted item uh be it some kind of hat or gloves or a little basket or a coaster uh, that's great. Obviously, I'm going to love getting those, but it can also be any other kind of craft that's uniquely you. It can be knitting, it can be painting, it can be woodworking, paper crafts, whatever it is that you really like to do. Again, uh, I'm, I'm only going to put into the video up to three photos per person, but feel free to send five or six if you would like so I can pick the ones I like best and think will look best in the video. So, Garden collaboration next. I want to try to get that one uh, all put together by the end of, at least get all the submissions by the end of September. And then uh, hopefully the craft collaboration by the end of October. I might extend it out, you know, I, just like I did with this canyon one. And if I don't get enough photos, I'll probably extend it out. But that's my goal anyway. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed my this and that for the week. And don't forget to check out the links I'll be putting down below. And anything you'd like to share on anything I talked about, the potatoes, the covers, whatever, go ahead and put those in comments down below. And thanks for watching. Take care and God bless. <laughs>